This morning, I really want to talk to you about rest. Okay, uh, it's in my heart uh, to speak to you about rest. I hope I got the right slides. You know, I'm always doing this. I prepare the slides and then I copy the wrong <laughs> file, but I hope this is the right uh, file. I want to talk to you about rest, what it is to rest in the Lord. When uh, Pastor Clarence asked me to, to preach on Sunday about a month ago, yeah, about a month ago, you know, two, two topics really came up in my heart. And one is I wanted to really talk about integrity, <laughs> what it means to have integrity, you know, biblically and in the world and all that. But, you know, as, as I began to ponder, God began to speak to me about rest. And you know, that it has been a very, very restful couple of weeks for me. I don't think I've slept so much ever before. <laughs> you know, I'm really very rested. You know, I've had good food, praise the Lord. You know, it's really good uh, blessings. You know, and it's been a very restful time for me. And, and I begin to understand why. Because when there's so much of turbulence, so much of nonsense, so much of... Funny things happening, it is so important for us to step back, you know, stand our ground and, you know, just rest in the Lord. Amen. Amen. So what I want to do this morning is I want to first of all, look, take you through some dynamics of faith. It is so important when you talk of rest, you must come to rest through faith. You must understand the fundamentals of faith. It's not a faith message anyway. It's a rest message. But you, you need to understand a bit of, of, of uh, the, the fundamentals of faith. And then I will look at rest. I, give you various, I will give you various definitions of rest. And then I will give you biblical perspectives or viewpoints on rest. What is rest according to what the word of God says? Because, you know, it's not my opinion. It's not someone else's opinions that matter. It is what the word of God says that matters. Amen. And then we will, uh, I will give you, leave you one very important reason why we need to strive or work to enter into rest. Okay? Now the slides are behind. You can get a copy, have regard to local culture. And maybe you, want, you need to clear with the pastor and all, but I have no problems. The slides are behind with the media guys. I also have an outline which you can, you know, you can... Pass around, it's all at the back later. Now in this, this evening service, I will be giving you more reasons on why rest is, is needed. I mean, you know, then, because I can't finish everything in one go. So in the course of one day, I can finish it and then go back and get some good rest. <laughs> and get up tomorrow, Monday morning at 5 o'clock in the evening. In time for dinner. <laughs> you know, I mean... It's a strange thing. I've got an inbuilt alarm clock. You know, I, I get up just before meal times. Okay, I, I want to look at faith, you know. It is so important uh, for us to truly understand faith. Because in Christian life, you will achieve nothing unless you achieve it through faith. I mean, the Christian life from the beginning to end is a life of faith. Whether you like it or not. I mean, at some point of time, you've got to believe that there is a God. You've got to believe in Jesus. And you've got to believe that all the blessings that you need in this earth, Jesus has purchased by his work on the cross. In essence, that is faith. So faith is so important to our Christian life. Now, the Bible says this in Romans Chapter 1, verse 17. Let's, let's look at it. It says, this good news tells us, talking about the scripture, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is true faith that a righteous person has life. I love the way it says it here. Yeah, how do you get life? True faith. True belief. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Let me just read it to you. It is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. 
Scriptures say it is through faith that the righteous person has life. You see, faith is the embedded technology or process in Christian spirituality. That's a God-designed process. You want God to heal, praise the Lord. It's a good thing. But you, how do you achieve it? Through faith. So when we talk about faith, we need to understand there's both an internal aspect, uh, internal dimension. There is also an external dimension. The internal dimension requires you to believe. You've got to believe. You, you know, you've got to work things on the inside and just accept it. External that. The external dimension are those actions you do as a result of what you believe. As the Bible says, you know, with our heart we believe and with our mouth confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's how we are saved. So there's always this relationship with the internal dimension and the external dimension to faith. And so external dimension speaks to us about all the Faith actions that, that, that we do. You know, you know faith, is, uh, faith is not something that is uh, empty. There, there are works, there are actions to faith. In James chapter 2 verse 26, you probably know this word. This, this, this uh, verse, it says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You know, as a result of what you believe on the inside, you act in a corresponding manner. You act in a consistent manner as a result of what happens on the inside. That, that's what James is trying to say. It's not that you, you can work yourself to salvation. No, no. I mean, as a result of being a believer in Christ, what is it you do? What, what fruit do you produce? How do you treat a person? Jesus himself told the disciples, John 6, 29, he says, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. It cannot get clearer than that. That's the only work. When you talk about a work of action, a work of faith, this is the only work that God wants you and I to do. That is to work on our belief. I mean, it's... it's <laughs> It's all right, you know, when there's nothing happening to you and, you know, yes, hallelujah, I'm going to be a, you know, what's the song again? I'm going to be a what? Ah, yeah, <laughs> we're going to have a victory. I'm sorry, I'm not a worship leader. You, you, you know, we, we can sing and, and dance and, and, you know, do the, all the right things when everything's A-OK -okay in our lives. No need to work on our belief. But when your hair is falling out because of radiotherapy, when you've got lumps all over your body, I mean, it's going to take work to believe that Jesus heals. A lot of us are so, you know, gung-ho about wanting to do the works of ministry. And we are so frustrated because... We, we're not seeing any open door. We're not seeing any open door in music. I know, Pastor, God has called me to be a prophet to the nations. God has called me to healing ministry. Why isn't anything happening? Well, maybe, just maybe, God wants you to work on your belief. Amen. Amen. You know, I come from the prophetic movement. And I mean, it's in a mess. Because people do not have a true idea of who Jesus is. And so if it's you and, and you're wondering, you know, why isn't God putting me out yet? Why isn't God... Leading, leading me, don't worry. God has you covered. These moments while you wait for, the, for what God has called you to do, work on your belief. Because I tell you, faith in Jesus 
is something that, you know, you're going to work at it. Especially when things are not going well. I mean, it's true in, even in a, in, a, in a marriage. you got to work on your relationship. I mean, marriages may be made in heaven. I believe that. But guess what? They are lived on earth. Different dynamics apply. Different dynamics. Do you, you, you follow what I'm saying? So, you know, it's nothing is wasted in God. So take the time, if it's you, to work on your belief, to understand Jesus. Because we have so many, you know, so many mistaken views about who God is and who Jesus is. Amen. You follow what I'm saying? A lot of these faith actions, they are oral, they are vocal in nature. You know, I mean, it's, it's what you say. A lot of these faith actions, you don't have to, you don't have to do funny things. You, it's, it's, it's what you say, what you confess. In uh, Luke 17, there is this, uh, I don't have the words. Uh, uh, there's this passage about uh, the mustard seed. You know, uh, Jesus is talking to the disciples and, and uh, he's teaching them on forgiveness. And he says that, you know, if someone comes and offends you seven times in a day, you've got to forgive them seven times. And the disciples are smart. They say, Ayo, how can like that? And so they tell Jesus, please increase our faith. Give us large faith. And then Jesus turns around and tells them, he says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you will say to the sycamore tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it will be done for you. What is God saying? What is Jesus saying? He's not saying all the, need, the faith you need is just the tiny, weeny bit. No. He's not saying that. What Jesus is saying is, it's not so much the size of your faith that matters, but how you exercise your faith. And God says you exercise your faith by what? By speaking to those obstacles that are in your way. You see, a lot of faith actions are vocal in nature. You have the prayer of faith. What is the prayer of faith? That is when, when you pray, you believe you already have the answer. That's a prayer of faith. A lot of people, when they pray a prayer of faith, they expect God to have faith in their prayers, but they don't have faith in their own prayer. Not going to happen. You know, I've, I've been to prayer meetings like that. I confess, but it's under the blood. But, you know, it's so embarrassing. We will pray for auntie so and so God. Or we pray healing for this auntie. Thank you, Jesus. You bring her out of that situation. You heal her. And then we go to the mama after prayer meeting, have a te tare, and the conversation goes something like that. Hey, how is auntie so and so? Oh, you're terrible uh, situation. <laughs> Doctor say no hope already. We better prepare, you know, better get the church ready, you know. Don't know where. I mean, can you imagine? You've killed the poor auntie even before she's dead. <laughs> I mean, I've been there, done that. Sorry, God. But you know, we, we, we don't really have faith when we pray. So the prayer of faith is when you pray, you believe you have the answer. Then you have confessions. The, the, the power of confession is this. You, you know the truth of God's word and you declare it. You know, it's very general in nature. Pastor Jai, two weeks ago, is talking about your identity, right, Pastor? You're talking about what, what it is to be... Uh, 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 a victor, what it is to have victory. You know, he's talking about so many aspects of your identity. So you are saying in the morning you get up, I am the beloved of God. I am more than a conqueror, not just a conqueror. I am more than a conqueror. That's confession. That's speaking to your circum, not just your circumstances, but that's speaking out. Satan has got big ears, he'll hear. Then you have declarations similar to confession. You, you declare a promise from the word of God or you read the word of God out. That's a declaration. 
Then you have decrease. That's not a faith action. You know what's decrease? Decrease is where you take the specific promises of the word of God and you speak it or you apply it to your circumstances. That's a decree. For instance, if you're feeling blue or you're feeling depressed or you find that, you know, there's, there's some lack in your life, you can take John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus, have come to give them life, life in all its fullness. So you can apply it. In Jesus' name, this depression, I command you to live. Because I decree my life is full. I decree I have more than enough joy. Decree it in your life. Don't be malu. Malu apa, boss? Ku. <laughs> you know, I mean, speak it, decree it. You know, you, you, the, a decree is a legal word. And it, it means... It means you are judging your circumstances according to what is written in the word of God. That's a decree. So when you decree joy, you decree fullness, you decree peace into your life, you are acting as a judge in your own cause. You are, you are judging your circumstances in the light of God's word. That's a faith action. A lot of faith actions are oral in nature. Now, all these things that you do, yeah, the various faith actions and the, the, the meditations and, you know, everything else you may do in the name of faith, those actions, those works of faith must lead you to the highest form of faith. And what is the highest form of faith? Four words, rest. Four letters, rest. Rest is the highest form of of faith, and I will I will show you lately. I mean, I'll show you later what rest actually means. It's amazing. Now, what does rest mean? There are a couple of. Uh, can you can you go to the next slide? Rest means a couple of things, and it means well, at its most basic, no activity or work. Sabbath day, Shabbat, means a stopping of work. Quietness. Quietness is rest. Calmness means rest. Peace means rest. Serenity, a form of peace. Apparently it's more peaceful than peace. I don't know. I mean, probably is. It, that's rest. Confidence. That's rest. Stability. That's rest. I mean, rest is a loaded word. In the word of God. I mean it means all this and some more. That's rest. And so when you rest in God. It means you are stable in God. Means you have confidence in God. Means you have the peace of God. That means you are calm when everyone is freaking out. Because you know how the story ends. That's rest. Today, everyone is WhatsApping everyone every five minutes, you know, faster than CNN. <laughs> what did this, what did that, and what this, and what that. Everyone wants to be an armchair politician. <laughs> They're not resting in God. <laughs> Come to pray for church. I pray for the country. Ba, 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 na, 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 ba, 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 na, na, na. That's why the country is gone bananas. That's all we do. You know, but, but, but we, we need to rest and need to have confidence that God, got, God has got it no matter what. No matter what. You know, I was telling my friends, so what life? There's persecution. If I die, I don't rugi. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think it'll come to that. But, you know, if, if it happens, so what? But my friends say, how can you do that? I say, why not? I know what the word of God says. Amen. 
you know, you, 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 you see what's happening in China. Yeah, it's terrible, the, the virus and all that. But then people are coming to God now. People are coming to God. But you don't need a disease to do that. Amen. So rest means all those kind of things. Now, what, how does the Bible define rest? What, what are the biblical perspectives of rest? Let's, let me look at, uh, at the first point. It's a series of about six statements I have concerning rest. The first thing I want to tell you about when you talk of biblical rest is rest is found only in one person. His name is Jesus Christ. And it's different from what the world offers. I'm sorry if you're looking somewhere else for rest, you ain't going to find it. In Matthew 11 verse 28, the Bible says this. These are the words of Jesus. He says, come to me, all you who labor and what? Heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle, lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. Rest for your souls. I love how the message says this. And I want to read this from the message. In uh, the same chapter, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Can you advance the next slide? Oh, I, I just love, if there is one reason why you need to get the message Bible, it's because of this verse. You know, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Yes. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do this. Do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Wow, I love that. That's a good name for a church or a ministry or something. Rhythms of grace. ROG. <laughs> I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. Wow, amazing. This is rest. It is Jesus who gives us rest. And the rest that he gives, as he says, as I said earlier, is different from what the world gives to you. Different. You can't meditate your way to the rest, kind of rest that Jesus can give. Look at John 14, verse 27. This is Jesus saying, he says, Peace I live with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You see, I, I, I do not give to you as the world gives. The rest of the peace that Jesus gives is different. Different from what the world gives. And the kind of stability, the confidence, the peace that only Jesus gives... You cannot get, I'm sorry, but you cannot get it from Santa Maria, Mama Mia, or what's his name, Baba. Although the Babas are more highly qualified, perhaps, they all have double BAs. B-A, B-A, Baba. <laughs> yeah, the Babas are all very qualified fellows. Double BA, man. But no honors. You know, you can't get it anywhere else. The kind of peace, the kind of rest that Jesus gives you. Today the world is crying out for rest. The cabinet ministers for the last 72 hours have had no rest. You look at Guaneng's face, it really looks like Tokong now. <laughs> You know, I mean, the kind of rest that only Jesus gives is what satisfies us and will meet your every need, I tell you. You know, you have Eddie Young coming. And if you hear his testimony, it's amazing. And I would encourage you to go. You know, he's a man who came out from so much of demonic influences. He would have breakfast with demons, lunch for demons. 
And then God took him out of that. And then to his shock, I mean, he was so amazed, you know, he came out of that. And then he went to church. And then to his shock and horror, he found the demons in church. <laughs> but that's his story, okay? I'm not going to steal his thunder. You ask him. <laughs> you know, you ask him about his story. He's got an amazing story to tell you. So the word peace means, you know, prosperity. It means quietness. It can only come stability. It can only come from Jesus. Amen. And only Jesus is different from what the world can offer you. People are doing funny things. They're meditating under a tree, meditating in a cave. I mean, what? Are you a bat for Christ or what? <laughs> I mean, haven't you heard? It's not a good thing to be a, be a bat these days. I mean, people do funny things when they don't know the source of true rest. You know, he, you know, I mean, man is funny, but thank God for being God. Next thing about rest, biblical rest is this. Rest means seizing from your own efforts to obtain rest. You stop from, you know, Trying to get into a lotus position, thank God. I cannot ever get into a lotus position. <laughs> I mean, my mother says it's because you are, look like a bitter God. <laughs> I mean, so I told my mother, I said, you must embrace your mistakes, give me a hug. <laughs> no, but you know, Rest means stopping from your own efforts, seizing from your own efforts to try and get their confidence, try and get their peace. You're stopping from your own efforts. In Isaiah 64, the Bible tells us why. Isaiah 64 verse 6, it says this. We are all infected and impure with sin when we display our righteous deeds. They are nothing but filthy rags. I mean, you know, I, I let you, I leave you, you go and find out what filthy rags means. It's horrible. Certain things can't be said from the pulpit. My Bible says this. Look at what the definition of filthy rags is. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. So to enjoy God's rest, confidence, and stability, you must let go of your own efforts of trying to enter into rest. I mean, do you follow what I'm saying? We think we know it, but we don't. Our righteous deeds, the Bible says it clearly, are like to God, filthy rags. You can't do anything with it. You know, in Hebrews 4 verse 10, the Bible says this. It says, whoever has entered God's rest, has also rested from his works as God did from his. Do you have that in Hebrews 4.10? Yeah. Whoever has entered God's rest has also what? Stopped from his own works just as God stopped from his works. If you read Hebrews 4 and 5, you will see how generation of, of Jews didn't make it into the promised land and they were left and they were condemned. Why? Because they refused to believe and they refused to enter into rest. They wanted to do, oh, they do, to do their own thing and they died in the wilderness. You know, so if you want rest, understand. Stop from your own effort. Look at Jesus, the rest, the confidence, the peace, the ability he gives you different from the world. You can only get that when you stop trying to make that happen. The third thing, uh, you know, I, 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 I just digress a bit. You know, demons have no rest. Demons want rest, but they can't get any rest. In, uh, where is it? In, is it Matthew or Luke? I, for, I forget that, the chapter and verse. There's this story about how when demons leave a man, they walk through the dry... Uh, places, they walk through the wilderness, you know, finding rest, 
but they have none. You know, so when demon leaves a man, he goes through looking for rest. Wilderness, he goes into the wilderness, dry places, looking for rest. He cannot find rest. Then he comes back to the same place he came from. He goes in, he looks, wow, the place is so tidy. He goes out, brings in other seven other demons. Now, it's not that the demons are throwing a party, no. Why the demon goes out and brings in seven other people is because that fellow who was there in the beginning now wants to get some rest. So he's subconning the work to the other demons. Because what do demons do? They steal, kill, and destroy. You know, you know that's all they do. Steal, kill, destroy, steal, kill, destroy. No rest. They always are up to something, doing something negative, destroying. And so now he goes, he looks for rest, he cannot find. Comes back to the house, he goes, oh no, the guy is all clean. And so he thinks he can get some rest by going out and bringing some other subcontractors to come and destroy the place. You understand? Demons... One rest, they find no rest. You know, and, and I, I say this because in ministry you see so many people. They're like super efficient, super productive. We all need to be productive. But they're constantly, you know, doing no sleep, no this thing, you know, constantly working. You look at them also, you get tired. <laughs> Goodness, I had a boss like that. She sending, sends me emails at 3.55. I answer at 4.10 in the morning. She said, why so late? <laughs> <laughs> so what did I do? I took the restful way and resigned. <laughs> the third thing about rest is to, to rest is to have complete confidence in the word of God. And I want to tell you what complete confidence is. You see, Jesus gives an example of this in, in the Bible. In, uh, there's, there's, in, in Mark 4, there's this uh, story where Jesus and his disciples are crossing the lake to go somewhere else. And Jesus says this. They get into the, the boat in, uh, in verse 35 of Mark 4. He says this. Let us, Jesus says, let us go across to the other side. So he wants to go somewhere else. He gets into the boat. He tells the disciples, let us go to the other side. Okay? So they go to the other side. Okay? They go to the other side. Uh, they're crossing. They want to go to the other side. As they're crossing the lake, a storm happens. A storm happens. There's this big storm that, 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 that blows out. The disciples are so afraid. In Mark 4 verse 38, they, they, they tell Jesus this. They go to Jesus, but he was in the, in the boat asleep. And they woke him and says, Teacher, do you not care what they are perishing? Oh, it's okay, bro. I, I'm still not done yet. <laughs> okay. He did tell Jesus. He says, hey, you know, where, where are you? They're offended because he's not doing anything. He's in a boat in a storm asleep. Now, why is he asleep in the storm? Because he had already said, send out his word earlier. We will cross over to the other side. You follow? He's already spoken his word. We shall cross over to the other side. And so having spoken the word, the word of God goes into the boat and does the best thing that you can do. Sleep. Did you understand? So he goes to sleep. And, and that is rest. That's the essence of rest. Are you able to sleep in your storm? Most Christians know, Pastor, I'm praying in tongues. One hour, two hours, three hours. I'm sorry, but three hours of banana isn't going to cut it. Can you sleep in a storm? If you say you can sleep in a storm, then you know you are at rest. Amen. And taking sleeping pills don't count. You know, Jesus 
had complete confidence in his word. To the extent that even though he knew there was a storm, he could go to sleep. So next time you think you're in rest, ask yourself if there's a storm, if all this is happening, can I, can I, can I actually go to sleep? Some years ago in Subang, <coughs> there was this church that was burned down. You know, they burned the church and all that. And the pastor, when he found out, at that time he was in the airport waiting to catch a flight to go to a, to, on a mission trip. And so when he got news, he just asked, is, is anyone hurt? They said, no, no one is hurt. Everyone is fine, but the whole church is gone. The equipment is gone. And they said, no, oh, it's okay. He jumped onto the plane and went for his mission trip. And when I heard the story at the time, about 15 years ago, I was thinking, what a heartless fellow. But now I realize that that guy actually got the meaning of rest. Amen. I mean, no one's hurt. So it's okay if God wants to burn down the church, go. And you know what? Today he's got a bigger church, better equipment. Praise the Lord. You know, and so it's, it's, it's things like that. When you ask ourselves, and I ask myself that, I don't sleep very well in a storm. I sound like thunder when there's a storm. <laughs> I'm working on it, but now let me be honest. You know, it's a pulpit. I cannot lie. You know, so rest. You must be like Jesus in a storm that you're able to be in the boat, not tossing and turning, but asleep. So whatever your storm is, you find a word of God, you rely on it, and let it put you to sleep. Hallelujah. I want to share with you some points from Noah, and then I will close here. Because when you talk about rest, you're talking about Noah. Because Noah means rest. You know, and I, and I was beating myself when I... When I looked at it and found out the meaning of the word Noah, because, you know, I've been to Sunday school and before I was in a different church, they had catechism classes, you know, and we all sing this little song about Noah and the animals went two by two, two by two, you know, the kind of song. But yet, I didn't actually see the true significance of what Noah was. Noah is a type, you see, he's a prophetic type for us. He's a type of Jesus in the Old Testament scriptures, Noah. Noah is rest. In fact, before he was born, his father, Lamech, says this prophecy about his son. In uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 28, 29, this is Lamech. When Lamech was 182 years old, he became the father of a son. He named him Noah, saying, This one shall bring us rest and comfort from our work, from the dreadful toil of all our hands, because of the ground which the Lord cursed. You see, this was during Adam and Eve's time. You, you know, they sinned. God cursed the ground and all thorns, and it was very difficult. And, and until Noah came into the picture. And the father says, this man will bring us rest. Will bring us some respite from all that the negativity, the curses that we've been facing so far. And so the father named him Noah, which means rest. And so if you want to understand rest, you must understand this guy Noah. It's a, it's a very nice name, short name, but you know, it means so much. Because Noah means rest. And just some points about Noah and I'll end here. Noah shows us that rest is not passive, but rest means doing what God has commanded you to do. In Genesis 6, 22, the word of God says this, Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Similar things is said in Hebrews 11, verse 7. You see, a lot of times we get Mistaken, we think rest is going to sleep, not doing anything. 
Sometimes in ministry, people say, you ask someone, what are you doing? Oh, I'm resting, I'm waiting upon the Lord. Rest is not joining the TLDM club. You know what TLDM is? I'm not talking about the Navy. I'm talking about Tidor, Lepa, dan Makan. A lot of people think that's rest. It's not. It's not. Rest means doing what God has commanded you to do. You are his sheep. You hear his voice. If you say you're 30 years a Christian and you cannot hear God, man, you have a problem. You have a problem. You need to know that. If you cannot hear God after being so many years a Christian. And so rest is not passive, my friends. Rest is doing what God tells you to do. If he tells you to sit down, keep quiet, you sit down, keep quiet. If he tells you to give towards a cause, you give towards a cause. If he tells you to get involved in the ministry, get involved in the ministry even if you do not like how the pastor looks. I know someone who didn't join the ministry. Why? Because he actually told me this. The pastor doesn't wear socks. I mean, I don't know what to answer, you know. I'm not often speechless, but then I was. You know, stress is doing what commands you to, God commands you to do. Second thing about rest that Noah tells us is this. Rest gives you strength. Rest gives you perseverance to do what God has called you to do. You know, Noah was just after 500 years old when he started building the ark. And uh, scholars tell us that the ark took 75 years to complete. So here is a 500 year old man taking 75 years to build a big boat. And no one's a farmer. He's not a professional shipbuilder. The ark is made of wood. I mean, it's amazing. You know, I was looking at the story of the Titanic. The Titanic was made of thousands of, of, of uh, tons of steel. It was designed by a 35-year-old naval architect. Built by a well-established, famous shipbuilding company. Yet the Titanic sank, but the ark built by an old man, very old man, floated. How do you like that? Never underestimate what God can do with a common man. You see, because when you are rested, God gives you rest. When God gives you rest, he gives you the strength and perseverance to do what he has called you to do. You know, in today's world, we, we talk about speed. We want things fast. Even in the internet, nowadays you ask Google, he knows everything. It's scary. You know, I, I got a mail that day. I didn't know it was possible. You know, Google sends me every month or so a map of where I went during the previous month. Can you imagine? That's scary. That's scary. You know, you know I mean, we live in, in the, the age of information technology. Everything is so fast. But you know, in, in the story of Noah tells you that speed isn't everything. In the ark was the cheetah. The cheetah is an animal that runs at 120 kilometers an hour. But in the ark was also a snail. That speed is probably 0 0.0005 kilometers an hour. 
In the kingdom of God, speed isn't everything. Because God gives you the strength when you rest. God gives you that staying power to do what he has called you to do as you rest on him. I'm learning this, you know, because I've been working since I was 17. Working since I was 17. And sometimes it gets to you, there's a tendency to say, I'm a self-made man. I've realized how wrong that is. I've really realized how wrong that is. And now I'm learning to rest. <laughs> you know, 17 years, I won't tell you exactly how, much, how many years then I'll tell you my age. <laughs> but if you must know, I'm 30 plus plus. <laughs> you know, so rest gives you strength. Rest gives you perseverance. Work done in rest, according to what God says, will bring you supernatural results. You know, I mean, imagine this. Here's the man building an ark, right? And, and God tells him in, uh, in Genesis chapter 6, 19 to 21, he says this. You don't have to read the whole thing, but God says, he says, two of every kind of flesh will come into the ark. And then God says, all these animals will come to you. You don't have to go look for them. You build the ark, they will come to you. Now the, the ark wasn't a big boat. It was about 520 feet in length and it was about five stories upwards. The ark had capacity for 120,000 sheep. Not much. It was big in those days. Not, not big today. I mean, today's tankers, container ships are much bigger. 120,000 sheep. But God says two of every kind of animal will come into the ark. You, you know, I checked. I did my research. Today, there are 8.7 million living species on earth. 6.5 million on earth. 2.2 million in the seas. Let's disregard the, the creatures in the sea. I'm not sure if they, they went into the ark. Some people say yes. Some people say no. But just, just forget about the 2.2 in the, the sea. Let's take the 6.5 million figure. That gives you two by two pairs. 6.5 million times two is 13 million animals. 13 million animals coming into an ark that was built to contain 120,000 sheep. How is that possible? It's not possible. Physically, it's not possible. It's not logical and that's why a lot of people say, Noah's Ark is just a story, but it's not a story. It's in the word of God. It must be true. What God is trying to show us is this. When you are at rest and doing what God has called you to do, you will get supernatural results. There will be supernatural outcomes to what God has called you to do. It's simply there. When you rest, don't be afraid. If it's one year, two years, three years, you're building a church. There are 10 people, there are 15 people. You know, I once pastored a church in Kajang, and I was so excited. The first week of my pastorship, three people died. And they were tough cases. One lady died in the middle of a terrible family dispute. Another guy was beaten up and left for dead. That person met with an accident. I was thinking, God, why me? First week of pastoring a church. And then I had to go and ask my boss for leave. The first time he allowed. Second time he looked at me. Third time he, he was concerned. He says, what are you doing actually? What are you pastoring? Three people die in one week. <laughs> you 
You know, and sometimes we have. When God called us to do things, you know, things don't work out. But you stay the course. Amen. If that's the voice of God, if, and if you know that's from God, you know you've been called to do this. Do this because God will bring you supernatural strength. He will give you supernatural outcomes to what he has asked you to do. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop here. But my last word is this to you. I, I, I strongly encourage you, my friends, to, to strive to make all the effort you can to get into the rest of God. You know, I, I, I have the verses here, but I will not go into them. But one good reason why you need to rest is because your supernatural provision comes as you rest. I share very, <clears throat> very loosely. I, I, I have chapter and verse. You can get in the outline, but I'm not going there. There's a story about the feeding of the 4,000 and 5,000. Have you heard of it? Yeah, yeah feeding of 4,000, 5,000. Now that story is repeated six times. In the four Gospels. There's a feeding of the 5,000 and a feeding of the 4,000. Feeding of the 5,000 happens in a Jewish town, Bethsaida. So the audience is Jewish. The feeding of 4,000 happens in a town called Decapolis, Gentile town. Details are the same. Jesus is preaching. The people are hungry. And the Bible tells us in those accounts there were 5,000 or 4,000 men. Now, it's not that there were no women or children around. There's a reason why the Bible says there are 5,000 men. Let me see whether you can, you, can feel, uh, you, you can help me out here. There's a saying, in an English saying, a hungry man is an angry man. And so there were 5,000 hungry men who were angry men just after Jesus has preached. They are hungry. And so it must have been quite a ruckus. After Jesus has preached, these people, they are hungry. They're saying, hey, what kind of preacher? No food. Chukopla, Samo Makan. And then Jesus calls, you know, the details slightly, uh, are slightly different. He calls a boy who has some fishes and loaves and then he takes it and then he blesses it. He gives it to the disciples and they go and they distribute. Everyone is full and they have 12 baskets left over. But one important thing that Jesus tells his disciples or Jesus tells the crowd in all those stories. He tells the crowd to sit down. The word sit down means to rest. To recline. What is God trying to tell us? Six times in the four Gospels. It's simply this. Your supernatural provision comes as you wait and you rest unto the Lord. Amen. A lot of times we don't get that which we desire because we are trying to make it happen. We are trying to make it happen without fasting and prayers. We are trying to make it happen with our bananas. Ain't going to happen. But as you learn to wait, as you learn to rest upon Him, then you will see the supernatural provision 